Knock, knock. Who's there? Knock, knock. Who's there? In a way, that's sort of always the question, isn't it? Who's there? Who's on the other side of that door, literal or figurative? Who's there? And while we can try our best to look through that little fish-eyed peephole to discover it, or nowadays our Wi-Fi-enabled ring doorbell camera, the truth is, if we really want to know who is on the other side of that door, we have to open it. If you want to know who's on the other side of the door, you first have to open it. Only we don't, always. Sure, in a knock-knock knock, knock joke, of course we're going to open the door, or the joke falls flat. And if they keep asking us, we will keep responding because we don't want it to fall flat. Because deep down we know that even if every time we open that door we, get, we are greeted by banana, eventually orange will show up and we will be so glad. But in life, we don't always open that door for whatever reason, we don't. And to be clear, we do have our reasons. Stranger danger or solicitors or we're not dressed for company or more often than not, we just don't feel like it. And yet it does present a bit of a dilemma, doesn't it? Especially for people of faith. For those who claim and recognize that our central task is to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves, because as we know, if we only, if we never open the door for people we don't know, pretty soon we only start opening it for people we do. You know, the ones who look like us or think like us or smell like us, or vote like us, or worship like us. And in that kind of world, well, it just doesn't take long before people stop knocking altogether. They may recognize that the lights are on and people are walking around inside. But if no one ever opens the door, Why bother? And while that, of course, leaves one group out in the cold, the real kicker is that it's the people inside that are the ones who suffer. Only they don't know it. Because they're the ones who, though they have a warm place, are missing the true people they are called to share it with. That is, though they recognize that they have a place, they miss the soul-enriching, life-giving gift of communion, love. Not of some people, but of all people. On what side of the door do you find yourself this morning? At some point, for some reason, we stopped opening our doors to one another. And so often, people who look like me took it a step even further. That is, we moved our doors all together so that people who didn't look like me wouldn't be knocking on it. You know, we didn't want it to be disturbed by all of the knocking. And at some point, we lived in that way for long enough where it just became sort of normal to us, didn't it? A few years ago, we were hosting a citywide anti-racism training in our fellowship hall. And I was in a small group responding to the presentation we had just heard and doing my best to look like, you know, one of the good ones. When a young woman of color challenged those of us sitting around the table saying yes in response to our posturing, but who was the last person you invited into your home? <coughs> who was the last person you invited into your home? 
The call of Christ is to open our doors. If we want to know who's on the other side of the door, it starts with opening them. It doesn't end there, but it starts with opening our doors to try and get to know the people on the other side. But if we keep them shut, it's really hard to do. The good news is most doors open. That is, we can open our doors and let people in. We can open our doors to try and see who is on the other side because Christ's call is to open the door, not to some people, but to all people, young and old, black and white, gay and straight, male and female rich and poor, broken and whole, Republican and Democrat, trans and cis, citizen and non-citizen, and everyone beyond and between. That is, we are called to open our doors to all. It is a reminder that what is, is not what has to be. That the way we are living right now in our world, separated and divided and segregated, by wealth, by race, by whatever other distinctions we've put out there is a choice. And the good news about a choice, at least for those Methodists who believe in free will, is that we can always make a different one. That it took a choice to get us to where we are and it will take a choice to get us to someplace different. The only question is, are we willing to make it? Though, as we heard in our scripture lesson for today, making that kind of choice to change the way we live in this world is not as easy as it sounds. Now, if you've never heard the parable of the ten bridesmaids, let's just say it is weird, <laughs> complex, and a bit confusing. Sure, it starts like any good parable, the kingdom of heaven will be like dot, 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 which makes us think, okay, this will be nice, and so we're expecting like, you know, a mustard seed or something like that. And instead, we get this tale of 10 young women. Of course, we have to use young women. <clears throat> we get this story of 10 young women, bridesmaids, who are called to go and take their lamps to greet the bridegroom, or rather the bride and the groom, as was the custom in those days. The young women of the town would go and prepare the banquet feast for the newlyweds. So they were called to go take their lamps and prepare the banquet for the bride and groom. But we're told that one set, that is five of those bridesmaids were wise, and five were foolish. Five were wise, five were foolish. And we recognize this, don't we? We love to separate people out in easy ways to dismiss groups of people. These were the wise ones and these were the foolish ones. Let's just pay attention to what these are doing. We might have other categories in the story we use for today. It is the wise and the foolish. The wise ones were the ones who, when they went to greet the bride and the groom, took extra oil for their lamps. And the foolish ones, and you won't believe this, are the ones who did not. Seems like a fairly low bar for being called foolish. I know I very rarely bring extra oil with me to wedding receptions, so I'm fairly confident into which category I would be placed. But as luck would have it, the bride and the groom are delayed. And so all of the bridesmaids, the wise and the foolish alike, fall asleep only to be awoken at midnight when the bridegroom arrives and they try to trim their lamps and that's when the foolish bridesmaids, the so-called foolish bridesmaids, discover that they don't quite have enough oil for their lamps. Fortunately, there is a solution that is the wise bridesmaids in their wisdom have brought extra oil and so they just ask, can we have a little bit of your oil? And in their infinite wisdom, they said no that there won't be enough to share. We've heard that somewhere before, haven't we? And so instead, they send their so-called foolish sisters out to buy more oil at midnight <coughs> in the dark. Now, we could just pause right there and spend the rest of the sermon unpacking the challenges and the cycles of poverty and wealth that we find in our world, couldn't we? 
We recognize this, that we too live in a world where the poor are blamed for being poor, where we assume that it is a matter of just not having quite enough smarts, that if they were just smart enough, made a few different decisions, that they could pull themselves out of their, out, up by their bootstraps and find themselves into something a little bit better. Surely they are foolish or else they wouldn't be poor. Look at the wealthy. They're no dummies. How do we know? Because they have money. We could spend the rest of the sermon unpacking that, and maybe we should. But there is more to this story, and we ought to explore it. Because you see, why the, while these five so-called foolish bridesmaids are off searching for oil someplace open at midnight in the ancient world in the dark, the five wise bridesmaids are invited into the banquet and the door is shut so that when the so-called foolish bridesmaids finally arrive, whenever that happens to be, they have no choice but to stand on one side of the door and to cry out, Lord, Lord, open the door, or knock, knock. And the bridegroom, we're told, comes to the door and says, truly I tell you, I do not know you. And that's where the parable ends. With a simple statement, keep awake therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. That's where the parable ends. The question we're left with, of course, is, does he open the door? He's already let in all of these so-called wise bridesmaids, these who were so wise that they sent their sisters out to suffer, stumbling around in the dark, he let them into the party. The question is, is he going to let, let these so-called foolish bridesmaids in? Now, truth be told, this parable has long been understood as a warning to get right with the Lord. That is, this is classically been understood as a way to remind ourselves that we don't know when Jesus is coming, so you better be right and ready. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. And maybe there's some of us out there who need to hear that today. It makes sense for Matthew's gospel. After all, Matthew, just like Paul, just like Mark, just like Luke, they all thought Jesus was coming any moment. Incorrectly, they thought that, but they thought he was coming any moment, and so that our job was just to be ready and be prepared in this moment. The whole Gospel of John is trying to make sense of what to do with the fact that he didn't actually come back, what we're called to do instead. But here it makes sense that that would be one interpretation. But here's the beauty of a parable. Every generation gets to interpret it anew. So if the interpretation that means most to you is to just keep your ducks in a row, get right with the Lord, then by all means, take that interpretation. But here's another. What if this is asking us to look at the way we are look, re living in this world and to change, to pay attention to who's on the other side of our doors, and consider what it means to open them. Look, remember, this starts, this is about the kingdom of heaven. Now, maybe it makes sense to you that the kingdom of heaven would be a place where if you make one mistake, you forget one thing, you are left out forever. But it does seem to be missing something based on the other things we know about this person of Jesus, doesn't it? What about grace? You remember grace, don't you? The promise that there's nothing you can do or say to lose the love of God. We know that grace, it is nothing we did to earn it. There's nothing we can do to take it away. And if that is God's gift to us, freely given, we didn't do anything for it, then maybe the gift of this parable is a reminder that even if we show up and we have been gone for so long that we are utterly unrecognizable, even if we have messed up our life, and the person who opens the door doesn't recognize us. There is still a place. There is nothing 
you can do or say to lose the love of God. Nothing you can do or say to lose the love of God. Nothing you can do or say to lose the love of God. It is yours. You didn't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to take it away. You can forget oil every time, and that door will open up to you if you just knock. Maybe in the end, the question is not really whether the bridegroom opened the door in the parable. This is the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he opened the door. Maybe the real question is, would we? Would we open the door? Have we opened the door? The call of Christ is to open the door for all who come to us. It's just the start, it's not the end, it's the beginning. We open the door and we find our way towards relationship with one another. If it was just seeing who was there, we could rely on our ring doorbell camera, but it's not. It's about more than that, isn't it? Because opening the door is just the first step. We then have to invite those people who are standing on our outside stoop inside to find their way into our hearts and into our lives. We have to open the door and welcome them. The only way to know who is on the other side is to get to know them. That is our call as people of faith. That is our call as Christians to keep opening the door for everyone we encounter, for the people that are come to us, that people who have the courage to knock. Because we know deep down that even if every time we open that door, we expect banana, someday orange will show up, and we will be so glad. Knock, knock. Only one way to find out. May it be so. Amen.